<laughs> well, welcome to today's program titled Return to Business in the Southeast, How to Protect Your Most Valuable Assets. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees <coughs> in, the, in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Brett Bartlett. You may begin. Hello, and welcome to our discussion about protecting our employees and customers as businesses reopen across the Southeast. I'm Brett Bartlett. I'm a partner in Cypher Shaw's Atlanta office, where I'm proud to lead our labor employment team. I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I need to raise three quick housekeeping matters. First, our presenters today are joining us from different settings across the Southeast, some of us on cell phones and others on phones. We hope, but can't be sure, we'll be reliable as we speak. If we have technical difficulties, please bear with us. Second, for those of you attending uh, for CLE credit, I'll announce the CLE code towards the end of the presentation. Be sure to write it down. You'll need it later. Third, if you have questions to ask as we go, type them in the, into the comments section, and we'll do our best to answer them either as we go at the end of the presentation or later, depending on how much time we have. Now let's get going. As everyone attending our webinar today knows, our economy has been striving to survive through unprecedented, challenging times. Across the country, employers have had to make very hard decisions in order to survive, to protect their workers, and to ensure the safety of their customers and clients. For many, employees have been furloughed, while others have, been, have seen reduced hours and pay. Business operations have slowed nearly to a stop if they haven't stopped completely. It has, of course, been devastating. It has, however, been for the common good. In some pockets of the country, we're beginning to see a change. Where businesses have closed, and for most of us, we've had to shelter in place because of state, city, and county orders, now some governors are issuing orders permitting businesses to reopen, allowing employees to return to work and signaling optimism that things are getting back to normal, or at least to a new normal. But questions remain, even as some states' governors seem ready to give the all-clear sign. Are we ready to reopen? Are we, if we are ready to reopen, how should we do so safely? How should we be uh, bringing our customers and our employees back into the uh, properties that we operate? And uh, what are we going to do to ensure that all of them feel confident as they come back? In other words, these governor's orders raise the important question, are we prepared to protect our most valuable assets, our employees and the customers and clients who, they, who rely on us as we reopen for business? That's what we're here to talk about today. During the next hour, we're going to be covering state and local orders, just very briefly giving a, a lay of the land. We'll be talking about employee concerns. We'll be talking about litigation, liability, and insurance considerations. We'll be covering real estate matters, and we'll turn to best practices for return to returning to work and reopening business operations. I'm proud to be joined today by a talented cross-disciplinary team of SciFarth partners from our Atlanta and Charlotte offices. You'll hear more about each of them as we go, but I'll call out now that we're joined by subject matter experts in labor and employment, litigation, and commercial risk avoidance, and real estate. So let's get started on the substance. I'll kick things off by providing a bit more context. As everyone attending today certainly knows, in response to the COVID-19 virus, city, county, and state governments across the country issued a Byzantine puzzle of orders closing businesses, commanding that people shelter in place and otherwise strictly limiting how we all interact with one another. What we're seeing now is somewhat similar. Some states' governors are issuing reopening orders Yep, that's us here in Georgia. We've seen that. Some are allowing their closure orders to expire with some guidance provided about what that means. Others, however, are keeping their closure orders in place. And it's not always clear whether orders issued by governors will or should override existing county and city orders. 
That's looking at the puzzle of orders across the country. And I should note that our firm has a variety of surveys available to keep track of these puzzle pieces. Let's focus now, however, on the Southeast. On the next several slides, on the next several slides, we've summarized some of what the state's governments have announced about their plans to reopen. Uh, we're not going to cover all of these um, in specific detail as we go. Uh, you'll see that we've got uh, a nice summary, however, and if you uh, look at the materials after the presentation and if you want to follow up with us, we can certainly give you more detail. But let's talk for a minute about Georgia. Um, we all know, I think, that we here in the beautiful Peach State are leading the charge. Governor Kemp caught a lot of us by surprise by issuing the first reopening order of any state in the country, beginning with the reopening of operations like nail and beauty salons, bowling alleys, and tattoo parlors, oh, and the famous socially distanced massage. At present, at least according to the governor's directives, we are at a point where most businesses have been able to reopen as long as they follow standard COVID-19 operating procedures, some of which we'll be talking about a little bit later during our presentation. On May 13, unless something changes, the state's closure order will expire. All businesses will be able to reopen, and technically, there won't be any requirements around social distancing and safe operations, at least from the state's perspective, for any of those businesses. I would note that the governor's most recent order places stay-at-home restrictions on vulnerable citizens, namely uh, those over 65, and, and I don't mean any offense by that, of course. Just as important as what the governor's orders permit is the question of whether businesses are actually opening, even when it's clear that they could under the law. What we've seen is that mid-sized to larger employers are moving very cautiously for all kinds of reasons. Of course, they want to get back to business, but they are also keenly aware of the needs to protect their employees and customers' safety. It's also not a guarantee that if they open, they will immediately see business from those customers they've served in the past. Smaller businesses in Georgia, restaurants, single or several unit operators operating on very tight margins, have seemed more likely to open more quickly. Their ability to sustain while closed or with skeletal operations has been more limited. Their need to begin generating revenue, in many instances, more desperate. We laugh a little bit at those tattoo artists, masseuses, and bowling alley operators being the first authorized to open. Many of them could not have survived any longer with the opportunity, without the opportunity to bring in money. There are all kinds of other points that we could discuss about Georgia's reopening orders, and if you have specific questions, please submit them. But that's not all we're here to talk about today. Um, and so as I mentioned, we're not going to go into the other states in great detail, but I wanted to introduce my partner, uh, Fritz Smith, who heads up our Charlotte office to talk about what's going on in the Carolinas. Fritz? Thanks, Brett, and thanks everyone for joining us today. As Brett said, I'm office managing partner of our uh, newly opened Charlotte office, formerly of the Atlanta office and prior to that uh, uh, a member of our sh Chicago office. Uh, we're taking a little bit different approach here in North Carolina and we're all eager to see how this plays out. Uh, Governor Cooper has uh, adopted a three-phased approach based on data from testing, tracing, and trends and in consultation with members of the business community. Uh, to lift restrictions uh, over time. Uh, phase one will kick in on uh, Friday at 5 p.m. And for those of us who work in uptown Charlotte, for example, I think we're all eager to see how this plays out. Um, up till now, it's been primarily a ghost town uh, during the week, and I think we'll start to see that change um, starting next week. Um, how remains to be seen. Uh, we've got the three phases listed on the PowerPoint. Uh, I'll note that nothing's set in stone, and in order for Governor Cooper to continue to lift restrictions, he has made it very clear that North Carolina needs to see progress in several key metrics. Uh, which includes sustained level or decreased trajectory in COVID-like illness surveillance over 14 days, sustained leveling or decreased trajectory of lab confirmed cases over 14 days, sustained leveling or 
decreased trajectory in the percent of positive tests over 14 days, decreased trajectory in hospitalizations over 14 days, an increase in laboratory testing, an increase in our tracing capability, and the availability of PPE. As for South Carolina, I'll touch upon that real quickly. Um, South Carolina has had a different approach as well. Uh, on Monday, Governor McMaster issued an order declaring that the stay-at-home order will no longer be enforced. Restaurants can now seat diners outdoors in South Carolina. And prior to this week, the governor had already lifted bans on retailers, public beaches, public boat ramps, what remains in place in South Carolina isn't entirely clear. It's taken me some time to piece it together. But as best as I can discern, the bans that remain in place in South Carolina apply to indoor dining at restaurants, apply to close contact service providers such as hairstylists and nail salons, recreational and athletic facilities such as gyms, and entertainment venues and facilities, stadiums, auditoriums, movie theaters, tourist attractions, playgrounds, and bowling alleys. Uh, what we don't have from South Carolina, too, is any clarity on how long these remaining bans are going to stay in place. There is some assurance from the governor that he's going to lift them as soon as possible, but we don't know when that might be. Back to you, Brett. Great. Thank you, Fritz. Um, really appreciate that. Now I'd like to introduce our partner, Stan Hill, who works with us in Atlanta. Stan, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and then provide us with your thoughts about legal issues involved in bringing employees back to work? Sure thing. Thanks, Brett. Um, my name is Stan Hill. I'm here in the Atlanta office. Uh, before all this, uh, the COVID madness started, I spent uh, a half of my day every day working through disability accommodation issues and leave issues. And, and now that we're in a COVID world, that has taken up a larger and larger portion of my, my day. And, and I'll touch on some of those uh, observations um, as I go through my presentation here. Uh, the first thing that uh, I'd like to point out and, and highlight is that you know, as we talk about these state and local shelter-in-place orders and, and other restrictions, we need to then decide how, how we're going to comply with those on top of the existing uh, federal requirements, which here in the southeast is pretty much all we've got. Um, and some of them we have answers to, and some of them we don't have answers to. Uh, one that's interesting um, and is evolving is the notion that um, protective equipment is going to be mandated, and what does that mean as far as an OSHA compliance um, issue? And even things as simple as cloth face masks that might be required in, by some state and local uh, orders, um, and also just uh, by some employers deciding to do it, that may trigger uh, OSHA obligations as far as doing a risk assessment, considering alternative options to protect employees, training employees, and then ensuring that you have a sufficient supply of protective masks or gloves or, or what it might ever be uh, for employees. And ultimately, you know, keeping employees safe, making them feel comfortable, and also making uh, customers and clients and vendors feel comfortable, um, all are factors to be taken into account. And then, of course, we have the existing uh, legal frameworks that we've all had to work through uh, day to day. Um, we've had the FFCRA sick leave and, and family leave obligations that have come to the forefront recently. And for many of you on the phone, you've probably determined that you, those don't apply to you um, or your organization. However, some of those same issues um, that are addressed by those laws, we, we now may be confronted as we return employees to work. And, and you'll see that as we go through here. Of course, we also have the ADA to worry about and, and leave as an accommodation as a concept and also the traditional uh, accommodation um, that you might consider for your employees, and we'll get to that as well. Uh, also, it's important not to forget about the unpaid FMLA that, that's out there uh, and someone who has COVID-19 um, or is recovering from COVID-19 very well may be entitled to FMLA um, or as a caregiver for someone who has COVID. And then, of course, your existing employment policies to make sure that you're, you're applying those in a neutral manner 
um, and a manner that makes business sense for you. And so thinking about what policies you might need to change as your employees come back to work. One final note is, you know, in the union space, if you have a unionized workforce, some of the things we're talking about today might trigger obligations to bargain. And um, for those union-free uh, workplaces that intend to stay that way, um, you know, safety concerns and, and the things that we'd be talking about when talking about returning employees to work safely may be catalysts for union organizing. So it's something to keep in mind. One issue that, that a lot of employers are going to be confronting uh, is the idea of employees needing accommodations because they can't return to work. And I'll use the term accommodation loosely to refer to not only what might be required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, but also practical accommodations that uh, for business reasons you'd want to provide your employees. Uh, one, one overall observation I'd, I'd offer is uh, that you want to communicate broadly to your employees in a neutral manner. Um, it, referring, uh, treating all employees, say, over 65 in a certain way because the governor's order is what it is, uh, that, that may be too heavy-handed of an approach. Uh, you'd want to make sure that your communications avoid age discrimination claims and also regard it as disability claims. And so as we're, we're working through these, these issues, uh, by and large, um, and a communication that uh, enables your employees to make decisions for themselves notifying them about what the CDC guidelines are and that you, you likely will be following those. Any other uh, uh, requirements as far as uh, masks or in the workplace that you might be subject to. And then inviting your employees to raise any concerns they have about returning to work to an appropriate HR contact or other business contact who can then engage with them in an individualized discussion about their concerns and find a solution hopefully that works for both the business and the employee. One particular issue that, that is certainly going to come up in these discussions is requests to continue to work remotely. This is a sort of a unique time when discussing accommodations um, and um, this particular accommodation because um, as we think about the legal risks associated with denying someone continuing uh, remote work, we're going to be judged by judges uh, who are experiencing and, and well-versed in these issues of remote work. They're all conducting remote work as, as we speak. And so this is one of the few times in, in the history of accommodations and, and otherwise where as technology is brought to bear, we're going to find that judges are going to be experienced and, and knowledgeable about the issue. And so although the law itself hasn't changed, the obligation to provide reasonable accommodations hasn't changed, the lens through which this assessment is going to be conducted legally is evolving with technology. And so to borrow, a, to borrow a famous quote and change some of the words around, the, the arc of reasonable accommodations, one might say, bends toward technology. And so when thinking about remote work as an accommodation for someone who perhaps has an underlying medical condition and, and can't come back into the office, or someone who uh, has a, a genuine fear that might be a protected disability, uh, nevertheless, about remote work, uh, it's, it's something that, that needs to be thought long and hard about before denying it. Ultimately, though, it remains the employer's prerogative to provide any reasonable accommodation, and that may or may not be um, remote work. If there's multiple accommodations to provide, it's the employer's choice to decide which to provide. One of the mechanics uh, that we'll have to go through in returning employees to work is, you know, are we going to ask them about their health conditions so that they're safe in the workplace and everyone um, is reduced uh, the risk of exposure and transmission. And, and you may have seen uh, daily questionnaires, temperature checks, and self-certifications as some uh, ideas, and all of those are very good ideas. Um, now, when it comes to record keeping uh, on these, uh, one thing to think about is there's, there's no record keeping obligation if there is no record. So uh, one approach is to have a, simply a policy whereby an employee's presence is a self-certification that yes, they have checked their temperature at home, uh, yes, they do not have any symptoms, um, or some employers may feel that they need to have a record and, and have employees write down on a slip of paper every day when they come in that they've done these things. And any sort of records in this regard uh, would be medical records that need to be kept in a separate confidential file and saved for at least a year. Um, now, then there's also, of course, screening for some of the more uh, obvious risk factors, like have they tested positive and working through the protocols around when is it safe for an employee to return to work, and, and that's something that we'll touch on here later as well. 
Um, I'd say also one of the, the issues to think about when, when keeping your employees and your customers and your vendors at ease in your space is considering what protocols you might have to ensure that they are uh, likewise not having risk factors and symptoms uh, that might present an issue. And so things like questionnaires uh, or just notices at the front door, depending upon the kind of business you've got, uh, might be prudent. And then for larger, more public-facing uh, venues, for example, uh, or um, stadiums and things like that, uh, infrared temperature scanners as they're uh, commercially available uh, to scan people's temperatures with different ingress and egress protocols may be appropriate. And just briefly, a few words on testing. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot going on with testing right now, and, and really there's a lot we don't know. So as, as you're thinking about testing, I would just leave you with a few, few thoughts. Uh, why, why bring testing into the workplace and have a very good reason for that, recognizing that testing is just a snapshot in time, and, and ultimately the test is only as good as the, the, the actual test is, that is being administered, and there's a lot of uh, junk science out there on the marketplace right now. So as time moves on, we're going to see more reliable testing, uh, and, and we're going to see how we can interpret the results in ways that are meaningful for our organizations and the community at large. So testing at this point, I think, is very much for employers a wait-and-see approach, although if you're in a healthcare setting, certainly it's a much different proposition than if you're in an office setting. And, and we've seen that, you know, testing employees who are dealing with, with the elderly in a nursing home setting, for example, something that, that may be even thought of as an imperative even at this moment in time. But, you know, it is going to depend upon the business. And, of course, um, you're going to want to make sure that the test you are using is, is valid and reliable. And so with that, um, Brett, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Dan. And I'd love to introduce our partners, Rebecca Woods and Esther McDonald. Rebecca runs our litigation department in Atlanta, and Re Esther is one of the very, very phenomenal litigators on her team. Uh, Rebecca, over to you. Great. Thank you, Brett. Um, yeah, I, I am also the co-chair of the National Commercial Litigation Group and have been at this for over 20 years. So uh, what we're talking about, we've, we've seen, although admittedly not pandemic style. Um, we are going to see businesses face a tsunami of claims by customers and invitees who are interacting with them either because the business is on their premises, if you send people into homes or on properties, uh, or because you have customers and uh, folks on your own property. This isn't just going to be the Princess Cruise Line claim uh, where all those poor folks were stuck there and now they're locked in class action litigation. Um, and whether fueled by plaintiff's lawyers or our genuine claims, uh, we're going to see a lot of these uh, these claims, and they're going to sound substantially in negligence. They're going to be claims that your business failed to comply with the applicable standard of care. What that is is going to be uh, an outstanding and dicey question. Um, and some of those claims may sound in contract or be indemnification claims. We're looking at and hearing issues with businesses who have limitations of liability or more pertinently indemnification clauses in their contracts that weren't drafted with the uh, with an eye toward the COVID-19 world. So for example, if you have cleaners on your premises, the indemnification provisions usually limit their liability to their gross negligence or intentional misconduct, but there might uh, be room in indemnification claims for carve-outs, particularly when there are ways in which those uh, vendors like cleaners on your premises can solely control the way in which they're executing their job uh, and increasing risk to folks um, uh, on your premises. So uh, we're also going to see additional significant other claims. The folks on this call are more likely to be victims than the perpetrators of things like fraud, phishing, cyber, and privacy claims. But we are seeing a rise in sophistication and activity in this area. They're not just limited to grandma and grandpa being taken advantage of. So you might want to think about trainings and uh, raising awareness among your employees. Uh, Esther is going to introduce herself and talk for a couple of minutes about the risks of oncoming class actions. Esther? Hi, thanks for joining our program. I am Esther Slater McDonald in the Commercial Litigation and Class Actions Group. And as you all probably know, the plaintiff's bar is never one to let a crisis go to waste. And so, like Rebecca said, uh, those on the call are likely going to be um, victims of negligence and phishing, but they're, you're also likely to face class actions. We've already seen a rise in class actions related to the pandemic. Uh, 
colleges and universities are being sued by students seeking refunds. There are also class and collective actions pending against employers. Um, the cruise line industry has had numerous class actions filed against them. And as we return to work, we expect to see class actions in additional areas. For example, companies with subscription services or prepaid fees, we would expect to be sued uh, in class actions to the extent that they are not offering those services or events anymore, or to the extent that those services are limited, or the nature of the experience has changed due to restrictions put in place uh, to guard against the spread of, of the coronavirus. We're also expecting to see class actions against uh, financial services industries relating to how they're reporting uh, payments such as mortgage payments, rent payments, we expect we'll see an increase against landlords. So some of the things to think about are just think about, are you providing promised services? And if you are but have limited those services, have you done so in a way that still provides the essence of what you're contractually obligated to provide? And then Rebecca, our did you want to follow up on that? Um, I, I was going to go ahead and talk about the limitation that might be, might be the saving grace that may be coming from Congress, but probably <laughs> isn't. Okay, so um, there, folks on the the line may have heard some of the news coming out of Washington that. Um, portions of Congress are considering passing legislation that would protect businesses from claims, the very kind of claims that we're talking about here, uh, both in terms of the employment context and the third party context upon reopening. And those are probably locked in a hopeless uh, partisan divide. But I would note that even if a fairly modest proposal that would only protect employers if they uh, complied with applicable guidelines, if that were to pass, it would sound good but uh, of course, us litigators, we always see problems. That's, there's still a ton of litigation to be had around which guidelines uh, were appropriately followed along the maximum that, that all politics is local, all guidelines are going to be local. And each, uh, not all businesses are created equal when it comes to the facilities and the people management that you need to deploy to undertake reasonable uh, precautions. And even under the same roof, you might have differential spaces. So that's going to be a litigated issue as well as whether there was actual compliance. And then finally on this slide, there's significant uh, brand and reputational risk. How this bleeds into the litigation aspect is we're seeing a mob and righteousness mentality now on, in all directions. So there's no winning for losing. Um, and we are concerned that judges and eventually juries, should any of these third-party claims mature and get to a jury, um, might be affected. So uh, thinking about engaging your marketing programs in uh, how you're getting people back to business but doing it safely and uh, in a way that is considerate of your customers and your employees is something to help mitigate your, li your uh, legal liability. Um, now, with all that liability concern, everybody is rightly looking to their insurance programs to help. And uh, most insurance is probably not going to be super helpful. Uh, some will be. So uh, Esther is going to talk about what has been much in the news lately, and that is the, the uh, business interruption coverage that falls within property policies. So Esther? Yes, so most property policies will have business interruption insurance. And uh, this insurance typically covers against losses and expenses incurred because a business couldn't continue normal operations. It may cover things like rent, payroll, utility bills, taxes. The coverage is typically triggered by a physical loss or damage to the insured's property. And what causes or what constitutes physical loss or damage is the key question, right? Can the coronavirus or can contamination qualify as physical loss? And courts vary on that. Some courts find that it does. Others don't. It's important to check the language in your policies because they do vary by the type of policy and by insureds. And with insurance policies, at the end of the day, the language is 
incredibly important. <laughs> and just a simple change in a word can change the coverage. So if the cause of the damage for a business interruption insurance is covered by the policy, then a business may be able to recover its losses. As I mentioned, some policies will exclude uh, losses caused by viruses. The standard uh, ISO form will exclude virus losses, but other policies don't. Some policies are uh, tailored to specific insureds and they don't have that exclusion. So it's important to check your policies uh, and examine whether you're covered or not. Even if there is a virus exclusion within a policy, depending on the policy language, it's possible that a, a business may be covered if the loss was caused by an event occurring after the virus spread as opposed to by the virus itself. And then within that, there's also uh, sometimes civil authority coverage, which may also respond to losses. That coverage is triggered when a business is forced to close due to a government order. And this coverage, again, varies based on the policy language. Some policies will require property damage, either to the insured's property or to nearby property. But other policies don't require property damage. This coverage is typically implicated for things like hurricanes and earthquakes, where local authorities evacuate or prohibit access to an area. But the coverage may also apply to the pandemic's shutdowns. So many businesses are looking at that. It's a bit of an open open question. An important thing for businesses to remember is that some policies have strict limits on coverage. So you want to be sure you notify your insurer early, track your expenses carefully, work to mitigate any losses you have, and make sure you carefully adhere to policy provisions on other issues such as when or how to document losses. So those are the basics on that coverage. And Rebecca is going to talk about some other potential uh, coverage for businesses. So in light of where we are in this pandemic, it is unlikely that if any of you has uh, had a, an event canceled and if you have event coverage, you don't know about it, but uh, just know that it exists. It's usually uh, triggered by a specific event. Um, and uh, as Esther noted with business interruption issues, exclusion for viruses is not uncommon in those. Um, much more commonly, uh, particularly for this call, general liability or commercial general liability or CGL policies, all the same, are very likely to respond to business uh, to, to claims against your business. Those will again be focused on claims of bodily injury as a result of your company's alleged failure to adhere to the standard of care. Um, what will happen is the insurer will provide a defense. They'll usually issue a reservation of rights letter and they will drive the train on settlement. There will be two fights that you will have with your insurers about uh, your coverage under your commercial general liability. The first one, which you'll lose, is if your policy has a virus exclusion, and most don't in today's world. But if your policy has a virus exclusion, it's very likely a flat denial of coverage. You should still, of course, look at the terms. Um, that exclusion is not common now. It, you can bet everything that it will become uh, absolutely standard in the coming years. Um, the, the other fight that you'll have if your policy does not have a virus exclusion and your insurer is responding is, was the damage, the harm done to the, uh, the, the customer or third party vendor that they're claiming, was it an accident? Um, insurance is there to provide coverage against fortuitous events, events that were not reasonably foreseeable. And so the longer this pandemic goes on, if companies are not adequately taking care and following safe procedures and guidelines, they're going to give the insurers a much greater opening to argue, hey, you knew that this could use, this was totally foreseeable that somebody could get sick if you didn't Lysol and wipe Clorox your facility every night. And so we're going to deny you coverage. So keep, keep an eye on that. And the same conduct that you would deploy to minimize your risk to begin with from getting sued is also the same conduct that you would want to use to uh, demonstrate that you actually have coverage. There are some miscellaneous additional uh, coverages available. Uh, just know that you have to read the policies carefully and they're all going to provide very limited opportunities for coverage. Moving on to the final slide for the litigation. 
Um, in order to maximize your coverage, you're going to want to make sure you're minding all of the patchwork, and it's going to be frustrating, of guidelines, federal, local. Um, they're evolving. We all recall the CDC said no masks, and now they say yes masks. Um, and so you're going to want to document what your company is doing to comply with which guidelines, particularly because they're evolving. You're going to want to be able to show uh, that you did the right thing when they were saying what the right thing was, even if it changed later. Um, you're going to want to write down your action plans and think about demanding compliance with your vendors, for example, the prior example of cleaning. Um, and note and figure out how to stay uh, up on the evolving and, and changing standards of care. We anticipate those will continue to change. On revisiting contracts, you're going to want to look at your indemnification provisions. We talked about that very briefly. Um, there are, uh, you know, the gross negligence and intentional misconduct standard is probably not going to be sufficient. Uh, if you're on the on the receiving side of an indemnification obligation, you might want to seek a carve out for COVID type claims. And that is it. So I will hand off to our uh, folks who talk about real estate. Gail? Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, as Brett said earlier, I'm a partner. My name is Gail Evans, and I'm a partner in the real estate group here in Atlanta. I handle a wide range of acquisition, leasing, development, and financing tra transactions in all different types of industries and types of properties. At the moment, I'm focused on assisting clients with restructuring their leases for rent relief and advising clients on potential benefits under the CARES Act, which has become a, a huge area for everyone. And, and also, we're gearing up for restructuring and modifications of distressed loans. So before I begin, I, I do want to note that while the recommendations I'll discuss at times reference office or shopping center properties specifically, they often apply equally to other types of properties such as industrial or manufacturing facilities or standalone retail. Also, I'll note that in the interest of time, uh, because I have a lot to say and my outline, my outline is quite lengthy, I may not discuss each item on the slides, um, but most of them are pretty self-explanatory, and of course you'll be able to print those out for your use later. As, as employees, tenants, and customers begin to return to the workplace, it is extremely important that landlords and tenant businesses ensure they're ready to navigate what's next. It's also important to review risk in the physical reopening and potential implications for lease obligations. Your task is to balance health, safety, and financial implications for your unique, unique situation. Let me turn the slide. So first we'll talk about landlords. Uh, as you strategize the reopening of your building or shopping center, a lot of planning will be involved. I know that some may already have entered the reopening phase. Some, such as office landlords, are still contemplating that, uh, depending on the state. But planning, risk management, and communication are essential. So first, you plan now before the restrict restrictions are lifted, and in particular, select your reopening team, which absolutely should include your trusted legal counsel. Uh, as you proceed with your planning, you need to consult with your legal professional early on to review planned new procedures and protocols, operational changes, and other potential legal exposures. You should review with your legal counsel all leases, license agreements, other agreements, uh, such as agreements with vendors and janitorial and other contractors, because you must understand your rights and obligations under each of these agreements as you proceed to plan your reopening and your safety protocols. Uh, and as Rebecca and Esther touched on earlier, you must consult with your risk management and insurance brokers and review your insurance policies and coverages. Communication is important. This is as important for tenant relationships as, as anything else, to be honest. Um, well in advance of reopening, you need to communicate clearly with your tenants and your vendors and contractors what your protocols will be when you reopen. Because tenants and vendors need time to turn around and communicate uh, with their constituency. Uh, and the more communication, the earlier. Uh, the better the relationship will be when you start needing to uh, put into place and enforce these protocols. 
always be informed. You need to designate a couple of team members at least to stay abreast of changes in the law. As Stan touched on, uh, the law changes very quickly. Um, we're quite in a quite a flexible and fluid situation right now, and so every day things change and your team members need to be aware of any changes. And last but not least, um, think about the cost of compliance with governmental requirements and any non-mandated non safety measures you want to put in place. Can you pass those costs along to your tenants? Should you pass those costs along to your tenants? Review your lease with legal counsel to confirm that costs can be passed through. But also think about the benefits of recovering the costs versus the effect that might have on your tenant relationships. So you need a cost-benefit analysis here. And always consider your tenant relationships, which hopefully are going to be long-term. Uh, and as the economy recovers, you certainly don't want to have to refill your, your building. Uh, I won't talk too much about these next few slides because the uh, slides themselves are pretty comprehensive. Uh, but as you strategize your reopening, of course, you'll need to determine what types of protective measures you'll implement in your physical facility. You'll need PEP. You'll need possibly to require, at least require your employees to wear masks, which you can do. You need to review your leases to ensure that you can require your tenants and their employees to wear masks. Um, I haven't seen a lot of discussion on this issue. It seems to me that if you review your lease and you have a procedure or a, a provision for changeable or, or amendable rules and regulations, which most office leases do, some shopping center and other leases do, but not all. But if you have that provision, you're on much um, surer ground because you can uh, amend those rules and regulations. And of course, this would be a very reasonable amendment uh, to require your tenants and their employees to wear masks um, and follow your safety rules. Um, and again, your re a review of your leases will be helpful in determining all this. You'll want to think about social distancing measures in your building. You'll want to limit the occupancy in your facility, not only for uh, by tenants, but by employees, by vendors, by your brokers and other brokers, uh, although most brokers now are showing buildings via, uh, via Zoom or other online um, mechanisms. Elevators are a huge concern in an office building uh, and in a shopping mall because of the configuration of each elevator, which makes it extremely difficult to keep the six-foot social distancing. And we've all seen how crowded elevator lobbies and elevators can be at peak times. Uh, on the slides, there are several suggestions um, which were proposed by um, BOMA uh, for office buildings in particular. And I will say here that BOMA has a number of different resources on their website which are very helpful in terms of practical measures uh, for implementing these social, um, these security protocols. Um, common areas, again, and exits are areas of concern for distancing and cleanliness. Fitness centers and shared building conference rooms and workspaces, which are desirable amenities or, or were in the past, um, they present particular concerns. You might also have a lobby coffee shop or a small convenience store in your lobby, and all of these spaces need to be considered. You may even wish to close shops and fitness centers for a period of time, but do remember that you may have obligations under your license agreements for the shops and under your leases uh, for amenities uh, that you promised your tenants, such as fitness centers, uh, shared conference areas, and so forth. So you need to work with your tenants um, so that you're not, even though you may technically be breaching those agreements in their leases, you need to work with them so that, that you both come to an understanding that it's just not the best thing to do at this time. Also, communicate closures well in advance of your reopening and consider how long they should last. Uh, at last, if not least, before you reopen a fitness center, review all your existing waivers, revise them as you need to, and reissue for signature by your users. And make sure you're covered there for those fitness centers. The slides in include suggestions for access points. Do remember that any modifications to or closures of access points must comply with ADA requirements. That's, that's far uh, in excess of the scope for this particular webinar and um, could, could be the subject of a, of a whole, new, a whole 
uh, separate webinar, but it's well to discuss with legal counsel what kinds of uh, ADA requirements you may need to comply with. Uh, you'll want to think about signage, and you'll also need to ensure that your employees and your vendors and contractors' employees are properly trained on whatever protocols uh, you implement. Uh, so we'll talk about tenants now. Um, tenants are, need, particularly store tenants, retail tenants that may have multiple, many multiple locations, uh, tenants need to decide which location or office to open. So the first step is analysis of the financial and lease considerations for each site or store. Uh, the team should analyze each store's performance before the pandemic and projections for performance upon reopening. The analysis should include the cost of lease terminations if the location is not viable after reopening. Uh, also analyze whether the cost of post-COVID retrofits might render a site no longer financially viable. If you're a retail tenant, review leases to determine whether COVID-19 closures of other stores in your shopping center, maybe an, even an anchor store, um, have triggered any co-tenancy provisions in your portfolio. If so, analyze the steps you must take and the required timing to claim the relief provided under each lease. Uh, evaluate your relationship with your landlord. Where do you stand on rent? Have you paid April and May? Have you underpaid? Have you not paid? Have you communicated properly with your landlord? Again, communication is key in maintaining these landlord-tenant relationships. Uh, determine your strategy for, um, for that rent abatement, that rent short payment, and how you may make up the shortfall later on in your lease. And last on this slide, um, think about your lease and your, your ability within your lease to uh, give back space, repurpose space, uh, go dark, uh, or possibly to even assign your lease or sublease all or part of your space. Uh, you need to look at your lease to see what your rights are with regard to any of those strategies. Uh, and in particular, if landlord consent is required for any of those um, particular situations, what hoops do you need to jump through and what timing is embedded in the con consent provisions? Uh, some consent provisions require as much as 30-day landlord consent. So if you are contemplating that type of repositioning, you'll need to uh, determine that right away. Uh, and also look at whether there's any deemed consent, which would speed up uh, your right to sublease or assign. Uh, also, as a tenant, just as a landlord does, you'll need to look at how you uh, retrofit your physical space. Uh, it's not so different maybe from what a landlord will do and the considerations that you might look at. Um, although, you know, you will have some kitchens, you'll have shared workspaces that you need to look at. You need to determine whether to require your employees to wear masks, um, which you you can do, but you need to you need to determine how you communicate that, um, and how you handle conference rooms and shared spaces, kitchens. Do you close them? Do you limit access? Do you have people go in and shifts? Those can be very crowded areas. Uh, the slide again talks about social distancing, inspection of your facilities to make sure they're ready if you have not been in them, um, screening for visitors or for your employees. And then the possibility of a develop, developing a plan in case there's an outbreak in a neighboring store or office space. As a tenant, well, as a landlord as well, uh, you need to consider your signage requirements. Tenants have some particular concerns, especially retail tenants who need to inform their customers of new requirements while taking into account the customer relationship. Um, as I'm sure we've heard in the news over the last few days. That can be a very prickly thing. Um, some customers are not going to like it, but um, safety, of course, is paramount. Um, there may be certain requirements that come into play when you reopen, um, but there's also safety measures that you want to take into account. You want your customers to feel safe and be reassured that you're doing everything you can to make your space as safe as possible. And then there's some other um, items on the slide that talk about um, public relations, do you need to limit quantities per customer? Of course, on the landlord side, you'll want to think about elevator signage, 
um, other signage explaining protocols, entrances, exits, how many people in the elevator are allowed, and so forth. And recalling that this, this signage and other types of measures may physically need to be ordered well in advance of your reopening, so that is part of your planning process. Again, we have planning for tenants for social distancing within their space. I think about your path of travel and your common areas. Store aisles and checkout lines are a particular concern. Uh, there may be special considerations in industrial and manufacturing facilities where there may be production lines. Um, we know, we all know now that there's been a lot of problems in those manufacturing facilities, especially the meat plants we've all been hearing so much about. Think about repurposing. Can you repurpose your conference rooms? Can you, do you need to close them all together? Uh, and you need to think about and consult with your uh, labor and employment lawyer whether closures or limitations will impact any required meal or rest periods. Um, and to control occupancy in your space, you may need to change work schedules, stagger meal periods, and so forth. And again, it's always wise to consult with your L&E lawyer to make sure you're not running afoul of any um, laws or regulations. Briefly, think about supply chain and inventory. Not only if you're a retail tenant, which is obvious, uh, you rely on your inventory to keep things running and to uh, turn a profit. Um, and we know that supply chains um, have, have been slowed in the last few weeks. But also, you need your supply chain in order to get, get your critical supplies, such as hand sanitizer, uh, sanitizing wipes, and masks, if you're giving them to employees and customers, you're going to need those in, in large quantities to be able to reopen. That may be very difficult, uh, and it may dictate the time for, of reopening. Uh, I know this issue is top of mind for many of my clients. Um, so you need to as assess that, uh, assess your options for sourcing, plan how you'll source adequate uh, quantities of all these materials, uh, monitor it to make as, as supply chain comes and goes. I think it's going to be very fluid over the next few weeks and months. Uh, and then if you have inventory in your store, how do you keep it clean? How do you, do you disinfect it so that your customers feel comfortable? Um, how are you going to handle that? All right, last I want to talk about legal, con legal considerations. There's a lot of what I've been talking about is a, a mixed legal business um, bag, if you will. Uh, but here, we want to talk about legal considerations. Reopening is stressful for all constituencies. So I can't stress enough how important it, it is to review leases and other agreements and consider ADA requirements uh, before implementing any protocols and space reconfigurations either on the landlord or the tenant side. Um, this could be a subject for an entire webinar, so I'm just going to talk about highlights. Uh, first, uh, if, if you are a landlord, uh, and depending on the amount of leverage you have, uh, you're going to want to look at your leases uh, from the tenant side as well. Uh, depending on the amount of leverage you have, you, you'll want to review your leases and address COVID-19 related issues if you can. Uh, this includes possible release from your relief from your obligations due to force majeure uh, and build out issues. Um, understanding the effect of force majeure on your current lease leases is very important. Right now, most leases uh, have, for well, all leases have force majeure provisions. Most are very little benefit in this situation. Uh, because most do not specifically address pandemics, epidemics, um, and certainly not COVID-19 specifically. Uh, there are many courts, uh, such as in New York and California, that construe these provisions extremely narrowly, um, and in fact, going so far as to say, if it's not specifically addressed in your lease, you get no release, relief from obligations if you're affected by an epidemic or, or COVID-19. Um, so if you can amend those at this point, it will be all to the better for future negotiations uh, with your landlord or tenant, whichever the case may be. And, and understand that amending the lease at this time is beneficial for both parties so that the force majeure provisions would apply fairly equally to each party. 
Uh, so it's it's not the tenant or the landlord simply coming and saying, this is something I want for my benefit. Um, you need to examine any requirements for tenant build-outs as a landlord. Um, if you are in the middle of a tenant build-out build right now, a construction is can it has been extremely slowed in many areas. Uh, materials have been difficult to obtain. Permitting has been slowed down because um, city and county departments are working remotely. They're not able to handle the volume that maybe they handled in the past. Um, and so slowed construction requirements are going to affect delivery deadlines. And again, your force majeure provisions and your lease may not help you with that. So it's time to examine those requirements and how you handle that with your tenant. You can ask for a tolling of your delivery period due to COVID-19, and that's certainly reasonable. Uh, tenants should not be expected, though, to wait forever. And so probably in the conversation, there will be some um, discussion of at what point do, does the tenant have the ability to terminate that lease. Um, as a tenant, if you, your lease has a continuous operation covenant, ask for the ability to temporarily close despite that covenant due to COVID-19 issues. Also think about what happens if when you reopen, governmental mandates for social distancing and other requirements make it impractical or unprofitable to operate. For example, we've all been hearing that restaurants in Georgia have reopened. Um, we're also hearing that, that although they're able to reopen, many have not. And those that have reopened are finding that because of well, two things, because of customer hesitation, but also because of the social distancing requirements. They're not able to serve nearly as many customers in their restaurant as before the pandemic. Um, and so it remains to be seen whether they can, will still be profitable to the point where they can maintain their restaurants. Uh, if you haven't done so already, as I touched on before, address any non-payments and restructuring of the payment structure of your lease, perhaps an extended term, how you might amortize repayment of any missed or any rent abatements over that term. Uh, review what's required in the lease as to common areas and whether the landlord is required to provide enhanced cleaning uh, and whether you want to require them to provide hot water at this point because so many leases rec only require the landlord to provide cold water. Uh, Bill? Um, just in the interest of time because we've only got a, a few minutes left on our schedule, I'm, um, I'm done, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, Christina, uh, would you, and, and first of all, let me just uh, tell everyone that the CLE code is SS6612. That's Cypher Shaw 6612, SS6612. Uh, and people um, on the line, I know that we're bumping up against our, our timeline. Uh, we do have a section left that we'll go ahead and cover in short form if anyone wants to stick around, and those are the best practices for reopening business. Um, Christina, do you want to cover that, please? Sure. Thank you, Brett. Uh, so my name is Christina Medden, and I'm a labor and employment attorney based out of our Atlanta office. I am also part of the firm's COVID-19 task force, along with other presenters on the call, and uh, also part of an even smaller uh, return to work task force. So with the backdrop of what has been discussed by my colleagues already during the presentation, I'm going to just briefly discuss some best practices for not only a safe return to work, but also a sustainable return to work. And this starts with developing a return to work plan that is tailored to your business. So in developing a return to work plan, there are several different issues and factors to consider depending on the type of business you're operating, the locations where you operate, and the applicability of various state and local orders, among many other considerations. So with that in mind, I really want to emphasize that there is no one-size-fits-all model for the return to work process. Our goal is more to provide you with essentially a menu of some available best practice options that you can choose from in tailoring your specific approach to a return to work. 
So initially, it's important to think about determining an organizational approach, which starts with making sure that the right people within your organization are involved in making decisions and assessing how the return to work process is best handled for your company. So Gail mentioned a bit about this as well, uh, but this slide provides a list of some specific personnel that you would want to consider including on any return to work team to help drive this process. So identifying these people is an important early first step. Another initial step will be determining when you are going to bring employees back to the workplace and how you will select employees to return. So for instance, are you going to bring back all of your, all of your employees, including your part-time employees? Are you going to bring back employees that you might have furloughed? Uh, will you recall employees that, you, that have been laid off? So these are all considerations that you want to be thinking about. If you are only bringing back a subset or por portion of the workers that you employed prior to the pandemic, or if you're bringing back your employees in phases, you want to carefully think through how you're going to choose which employees to bring back and when. So to the extent you are using some sort of selection criteria, such as performance or a similar consideration, you want to make sure that you're applying any criteria in a uniform way and as objectively as possible. This will help to lessen the risk of any discrimination or other legal claims that could arise from selecting only certain employees to return to the workplace rather than others. We've also seen employers that are taking a phased approach actually allowing employees to select if they wish to return to the workplace. So this is another approach that you can consider and will mitigate some of the risk involved in selecting certain employees to return over others. After you do select employees to return, but before actually returning those employees to the workplace and reopening the business, it's important to ensure that you have the proper policies and employee communication plans in place. So I'm going to talk just a bit about that. So when returning employees to the workplace, there are a number of different policies that companies can consider implementing and a number that we have seen become more popular recently. And this will, of course, vary based on different circumstances around the return to work. But you also want to be thinking about, you know, are, are these going to be temporary policies versus longer term policies? If they are temporary, when are they going to sunset? And making sure that that's clearly communicated to your employees. Are these going to be standalone policies or part of a broader employee handbook? So one such policy that we've seen a lot of recently is some form of an infectious disease control policy with generalized COVID-19 related guidance. This policy could include information about helping prevent spread of the virus in the workplace, the symptoms of the virus, protocols for employees who may be having symptoms, as well as best practices for reducing the risk of exposure to the virus through good hygiene. Along those lines, updating social distancing guidelines and protocols is going to be very important. Uh, employers can also consider developing communications and protocols around face covering masks, temperature checks, and other screenings that employers may choose to do to make sure these are adequately communicated to employees. A few additional policies that are particularly relevant right now to consider implementing or updating are a travel policy, a remote work policy, and new or updated PTO policies. So once you've determined that you have the appropriate policies in place, it's important to determine how these policies will be communicated to employees. Employers may consider communicating new or updated policies to employees before the employees physically return to the workplace. So if employers, for instance, have updated protocols to screen employees in a certain way before the employees enter the physical workplace, and other measures that may not have been in place previously, it might be prudent to communicate these new measures prior to the employee's physical return to work. This could be by way of scheduling a remote or a virtual meeting to educate and update employees or simply disseminating the policies prior to the employee's return. It's especially important to communicate with those employees and human resources and management positions before returning so that these employees understand how to advise on and how to field questions about these policies prior to returning to the workplace. So 
So in addition to or instead of remote communication of any new or updated policies, employers may consider having a full day or half day orientation on the first day that employees return to the workplace to introduce these policies and to educate employees. Companies also want to make sure that they're appropriately complying with any new posting requirements relating to the COVID-19 pandemic before returning employees to the workplace. For instance, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act does mandate certain posting requirements, so you certainly want to be aware of those to the extent that may be ap applicable to your organization. And the final point that I'll just quickly make is that flexibility is going to be absolutely key in any reopening process. There are a lot of unprecedented challenges that we're facing, and they're not always going to be clear answers, and some of these challenges may require more of a trial and error approach. Practices and policies that you have in place may need to change and may need to change quickly. It's unlikely that we will be returning to any sort of business as usual. Rather, we really are returning to a new normal even when we do open our doors. So setting employee expectations around that is going to be an important part of that process. And with that, I will pass it back off to Brett. Thanks, Christina. Um, everyone, thank you for sticking around. We did want to just make a quick final word, and that is that you know, there is a lot of anxiety uh, out there. Employees don't necessarily want to return to work as uh, badly as we might think that they would. Recent surveys have suggested that they are anxious about doing so. So we need to be empathetic, as we will be uh, with our customers and clients, um, looking for the best opportunity to bring them back in. Uh, thank you guys for attending uh, the webinar today. Just a few resources for you to be aware of. We've got training coming through Cypher Show at Work to help uh, employers talk to employees as they return about safety. We've got the return to business and post-pandemic checklist. Uh, you can see the cover here. And we've got our COVID-19 resource center uh, that's available. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, you'll see that their emails are in the slide when you get the uh, slides distributed to you, and we will be sending those out. Uh, and we will try to respond to the questions that you've uh, asked as we've gone along today. We'll do that in follow-up. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar, and thank you for attending.